On January 10, 2023, Prince Harry's autobiography, Spare, was released. This highly anticipated book tells his side of the story from the beginning and delivers lurid details about his life. However, a leaked copy of the book surfaced only days before its release in the UK, with copies going on sale early in Spain. There's been parts of it shared that shocked, surprised me, because there's things that he's talked about that royals just don't talk about. I can expect of a celebrity, I can expect to even maybe from a politician. But when it comes to royals, there's certain things and certain parts of bodies and things they don't talk about and, and he's been talking about it. So it's a very it's a very frank, I suppose frank and you know he, he wants people to get to understand what makes him tick, I think is the easiest way to explain it. Confidently sold at half price already. I think it's terrible for him uh, to reveal his difficulties and unhappiness in public like this. I mean, maybe he thinks it helps him, but I can't see how. I think if he were truly committed to serving other people, he wouldn't be serving his interests as he is. From the leaked Spanish copy, news outlets in the UK shared that in spare, Harry recounts how he was allegedly physically attacked by his older brother, Prince William. Going into never heard before detail, he describes how their relationship fell apart over Harry's relationship with Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. In a moment of high emotion, Harry states William called Meghan difficult, rude, and abusive. Harry seems to be doing everything to avoid responsibility, as he claims William and Kate laughed at his infamous Nazi costume he wore to a party in 2005, which he described in their Netflix documentary as one of the biggest mistakes in my life. So the thing with the royal family is the biggest thing to them is trust. That's the, that's the be all and end all is trust. And once you've lost that, it's gone. And I think, I think that will have been lost. I think that will have gone. However, Harry is still the king's son. I know how much that love is, just that the queen loved him as well. And I don't think anything could change that. I really don't. I really believe that that kind of love cannot be uh, destroyed. But from the public point of view, there is the embarrassment part and the awkwardness of that. And I think that part. In a sit down interview released before the book with 60 Minutes, Harry shares his wish to be a part of the family again. Well, in Harry's memoir, there's a reported conversation after Prince Philip's funeral where Charles says to his sons, please, boys, don't make my final years miserable. Now, we have no way of knowing that's true or not. Like a lot of the stories in Harry's book, it might be exaggerated, it might be completely false, or it might be a verbatim recording of what happened. But I do feel that his referring to his final years is an interesting idea because he has no way of knowing how long he's going to live. I mean, none of us do. But what I think he wants to do during his reign is for it not to be miserable, for it to be an uplifting and cathartic experience. Because I think what he would like is that when he dies, the country to be in a better place than when he became king. I mean, we can only hope that he's proved right, but certainly the spat between his sons is not going to go away anytime soon. To be, I suspect, an element of whinging in this book, which I think, you know, we've kind of got the message now. And if he was to come out with some deep, dark secrets about the royal family that we don't know, I would think that would reflect very badly on him. Here we see Harry reaching out emotionally, suggesting that he wants his father and his brother back. So on that level, perhaps uh, a scope for reconciliation, but no contrition on his part. And all of this now builds towards, you know, the prospect of the gathering of the family of the firm at the coronation in May. Surprising and fantastic if this book put that all to rest and said, from now on, we're going to be a family. It's quite OK for Harry and Meghan to live in America, but to come over here and be part of the family in the holidays. 
I think that the general public, the public at large, would be amazed if they knew the level of manipulation and negotiation that goes on between the royal households and tabloid editors and newspaper editors. I think the damage has been done to relationship through the different media, interviews, the book. I don't know if it's, I really don't know if that's fixable. I know the king loves and adores both boys equally. I, I witnessed that a lot on many occasions. So I know how much that love is. Just that the queen loved him as well. And I don't think anything could change that. I really don't. I really believe that that kind of love cannot be destroyed. As far as the, the love between a father and son, I don't know. I, I'd like to think that one day that will be, that that's fixable. One day they can fix that. Even though the relationship and the public might never be the same again, it'd be nice to think that one day behind closed doors they can, they can heal that part of the relationship, which I think is, that is possible, I think. Crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace throughout the evening. Then at 10.25, their patience was rewarded with the formal notice of the birth. It was signed by Mr. George Pinker, the Queen's gynaecologist, and other doctors who attended the princess. The crowd cheered to the echo. The fact that Diana produced a little boy, an heir, um, I think just further endeared her to the British public. People loved her even more, and when she came out holding Prince William with Prince Charles, images that really just melted, I think, even the most hardened hearts around the country. And uh, it, was, it was a cause for great celebration. Um, Britain had come through a difficult time, and I think the royal family were giving the country something to look forward to. William had a, a fairly traditional aristocratic childhood in as much as he was taken care of by nannies. His parents were, were, you know, Diana particularly was a modern parent, but she was a modern aristocratic parent and she did use nannies and the nannies really were the people that William spent most of his time with. I've known those two boys, William and Harry, since they were born. Um, I used to change their nappies. They used to call me Uncle Paul. I've always been there, and I've watched them grow. I'm very proud of them. They're lovely boys. Being a new mother, there were, there were obviously challenges for, for Diana, but being a new mother and being a member of the royal family and trying to juggle everything within the confines of Kensington Palace, I think, really did take their toll. Now, Diana did make the decision to hire a nanny for Prince William, um, but she was always paranoid, I think, as, the, as both of her children were growing up. To anyone in the know, it was very obvious that the Wales's marriage was in real trouble um, by the late 80s. Um, and uh, inevitably, the announcement was made by the then Prime Minister, John Major, that uh, Diana and Charles were going to separate. And she made sure that the first people who found out that they were going to separate were William and Harry. And she actually made the drive to Ludgrove School herself to go and tell them. And uh, Harry took it very badly, of course, being younger than William. He, he was incredibly upset. William was very stoic and said to his mother, well, if you're happier, if you're going to be happier, mummy, then this is the right thing to do. Diana took it upon herself to give an interview to Martin Bashir, who um, was the presenter of Panorama. Completely unprecedented, a total shock to the royal family. Diana did this interview in great secrecy, but alerted William and his housemaster to the fact that it would happen a couple of days in advance. And the housemaster said, will you please come down to Eton and explain to William what, what is about to happen. And so she went down to, to Eton 
and she had the briefest of conversations, I think she was there for about five minutes, and said, don't worry, there's nothing sensational in it, you won't be upset, um, you know, you'll, you'll like it. Um, and of course, she was completely wrong. William was really upset by, by that interview. Harry was more sheltered. He was still at Ludgrove at the time. And um, I remember the headmaster there making sure that newspapers were banned. They were out the way. No one could watch that interview. It was his way of protecting Harry. I think at Eton, it was much harder to do that. And William was exposed to everything. And he called his mother in a fury and a rage. I remember speaking to Simone Simmons, who was one of Diana's closest friends, who recalled that it was, it was actually the rare and only time, I believe, when William turned on his mother and said he would never forgive her for what she'd done. William had been in the south of France before her death with his mother and with Dodi Fayed and Mohammed Al Fayed. And they had stayed in the Al Fayed's villa in, in the south of France, and they'd been on the boat that um, Diana had been famously photographed on. They had had a pretty horrible time. William had had a row with Diana. Harry had had a row with one of Fayed's children. They had hated the publicity. They'd hated the fact that the paparazzi were all over them. They hadn't really liked the Fayed's very much. Um, they'd felt hugely uncomfortable. And so they were quite relieved, I think, to get back to spend the next part of their school holidays in Scotland with their father. On this, the first day of their Balmoral holiday. The father was in Lord of the Isles Tartan, he is a traditionalist, but the boys chose more modern garb. Harry, 12, seemed quite relaxed. William, 15, well over six feet tall, finds being on public parade very difficult. Often he did look just like his once shy mother. They flew back to England, they went up to Balmoral, and they'd been there for some weeks, having the most wonderful time with, with all the royal family, the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, um, aunts, uncles, cousins, and, and their father. And their mother was due to come back the next day, and they were due to fly from Balmoral down to London to see her for the last few days of the school holidays before going back to school. Um, and they had had a phone conversation with Diana on the evening, on that evening before she flew back. She'd wanted to speak to both of them and they were playing a game and they were actually quite irritated at having to leave their, the fun they were having and go and speak to their mother on the phone. And so they, they tried to get her off the phone quite, you know, as quickly as they reasonably could and get back to their game. And of course, that was the last time they spoke to her. That was the last time they heard her voice. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured in a car accident in Paris. Her companion, the Harrods heir, Dodi Al Fayed, has been killed. The driver of the princess's car is also understood to be dead. The accident happened at just after midnight in the west of the city near the Alma Bridge. Uh, she died in the early hours of the next morning. And, you know, how does any 15-year-old and 12-year-old cope with that? Um, uh, it was devastating for them, obviously. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. This week at Balmoral, we have all been trying to help William and Harry come to terms with the devastating loss that they and the rest of us have suffered.
remember the day William and Harry came back to Kensington Palace after their mother died. I remember standing in the hallway and William woke, walked in and shook my hand and asked me if I was all right. I said, I'm very, I'm fine, thank you. Harry ran down the corridor, flung his arms around me and broke his heart. I still remember his tears wet my shirt through. He was broken hearted. Hearts broke around the world. People watched that funeral all over the globe when they saw the coffin passing and that little envelope on the top with a wreath of flowers with the word mummy, which had been handwritten by Harry. William and Harry walked behind the cortege. It was a long walk. There were crowds sobbing and, and wailing and um, hundreds, thousands and thousands of people lining the route. Uh, and they walked with their father, uh, their grandfather and Charles Spencer. They did rely on one another. They were very close. Um, the, the two are very different characters, but they, they complement one another very well. And they've always had a great banter. They tease each other mercilessly. And then when their mother died, I think that brought them even closer together because they couldn't share with anyone else what they had experienced. It, it wasn't, you know, like the death of, a, of any other any normal parent, because in, with the death of a normal parent, you don't have the world grieving as well. It was almost as though their grief was being devalued by the grief of strangers. So I think it was a very difficult time for them. And, and during that, sort of the, the years after Diana's death, there was a bond which was closer, arguably, than, than most siblings. William, although he looks like his mother, is more like his father. He's studious, he's very careful, he's very respectful, he's duty-bound. Harry, on the other hand, is a hybrid of the Spencers' red hair and the Windsors, but he has his mother's naughty streak. Harry was the sort of the frontline jester that, that will be the guy that be entertaining. And also, if you, if you ever got in a spot of bother, you know, if Harry were old enough, he's the sort of guy that would come and help you out. William would think about it. Harry was always the soldier. William was always the general. So when my two boys visited and they played war games, William had an army that he could direct. But Harry's happy to muck in. I think when it comes to Prince Harry, it's obvious that there's huge affection between the two brothers, even when he was very little, when he was 10, 11 years old, and he'd see the girls starting to scream because Prince William was coming along because he was that bit older and they could see he was very handsome. He, we're told Prince Harry would, would encourage the girls to scream and, and just because he knew it really embarrassed his brother. So he seems to be the more playful one, Prince Harry. And again, that would bear out what the Princess of Wales said in that Panorama interview about he's a more, uh, sort of, more of a Spencer wild child than, than William is. And we can see it, can't we, in, in, in the, the pictures we see in his antics and the kind of things he likes to do. But I also get the, the impression from the, the times we've seen the two together talking to one another and about one another and about that, because they've, they've spoken about their, their closeness as brothers, that you get the feeling that Prince William, for all his understanding of the seriousness of his role in the future, he makes it very clear that he needs his brother and he values that. Harry is a party creature. He always will be. Um, so obviously he's going to get caught out. Today's papers all carry headlines about his drug taking and underage drinking sessions. The paper which broke the story says the young prince smoked the drug on several occasions at private parties with friends. Yeah, in uh, January 2005, um, I, I ran a story about Prince Harry, a picture that we got of Prince Harry going to a party, actually with William, 
uh, and he was wearing a Nazi outfit. Um, it created a huge stink. William's reaction to the Nazi story when he had a chance to bend my ear about it was was very sweet and it was a sort of the way I'd like my big brother to stick up for me if I'd been put in the papers and, and obviously something I'd done had upset people. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, there is something very special with William and Harry, that they are extremely close. Um, and anything bad for Harry, William will stick up for him to the nth degree. Harry learned a lot in that small period of time. Um, and I don't think at that stage in his life, anybody could have said anything to him that he would have taken notice of. But luckily, he's, he's grown up since then. There's a long tradition of senior members of the royal family going into the armed forces, because after all, the monarch is head of the armed forces. Um, and it's a, it's a useful place, really, for them to be. Harry's service in the military um, wasn't just a sort of tick, you know, box ticking exercise. Harry was a, a, a genuine believer in the military and always wanted to be a soldier from, I, I guess, from the age when he was able to, to know what a soldier was. Certainly when I met him, age three, he was always in sort of khaki uniform and, and uh, he always wanted to be a soldier. Prince Harry's military experience was fraught with security concerns. He joined Sandhurst in 2005 and in 2006 the Ministry of Defence announced that he would be deployed to Iraq the following year. This led to a fierce public debate. Harry had been stopped from going. Um, his, his original deployment, he was going right up to the front line. And the press worked out where he was going to be sent. Then, of course, that meant that the Taliban knew where he was going to be sent as well, which meant that if he did go, it would be putting not just him in danger, but also his men in danger. And so Harry was pulled from that deployment. I have decided today that Prince Harry will not deploy as a troop leader with his squadron. I've come to this final decision following a further... Because of the way that um, the regiments uh, rotated in their deployments, it was quite clear that William was not actually going to make it to Afghanistan. He wouldn't, his, his regiment wouldn't go there um, for 18 months. And rather than sit around um, kicking his heels, doing training work in, in this country, he decided to go and look at the other forces. After Harry's deployment was cancelled, William trained in the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force. In October 2008, it was announced that Harry would follow his brother, learning to fly military helicopters at RAF Shawbury. To me, I didn't join the forces to be, like I said a lot of times before, molly cuddled or treated any different. And as far as I'm concerned, in my eyes, if Harry can do it, then I can do it. Uh, I don't really separate us in that much difference. And I think as future head of the armed forces, it's really important that I was get, you know, get, at least get the opportunity uh, to be credible and to do the job that I signed up for uh, and to do the best I can. I and mean, that's all I ever wanted to do. And the search and rescue role is now, you know, slightly different to obviously being able to go to Afghanistan, but it's still doing an important job. And yeah, I hope that it's, yeah, I hope it's a step in the right direction exactly for the future. Um, I think the, the struggle that I was talking about was mainly the exams and stuff like that. When you, when you sort of, the helicopter course, you start with what, something like four or five weeks of uh, ground school and exams. Um, Exams never been my favourite, and I always knew that I was going to find it harder than most people. Um, but I'm through that now, and uh, finally got hands on to uh, to a job that I absolutely adore. It is still hard work, but um, but I'm better than William, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's that you've bad. been helping him with the exam. Uh, yeah, an awful lot. He needs a lot of help. It's uh, yeah, it's the RF way, so you have to help the army out quite a lot. But does it come down to sort of mental maths tests? Or? Uh, yeah, a bit of that. You know, a few trick questions, try and catch him out. Seven eight. Yeah, exactly. Lots of that. I think the time when that bond started to fracture a bit was when Harry um, probably came out of, the, uh, out of the army and started going into royal work. 
Um, and I, I think he accepted that. He knew that. And he knew that, you know, to, to be able to perform two tours of duty was perhaps more than he even anticipated. Um, and then that sort of effectively landed him in an office job in the Ministry of Defence, which would not have been to his liking. And so that was the end of his military career. And I think at that point, you know, he acknowledged, like his brother, that he was cut out for royal duties. The space was, was quite small within their charitable world for the two brothers together. And I think Harry slightly railed at the hierarchy. Here was his brother, you know, his mate, but who was slightly pulling rank at times. And, um, you know, it was part of this new machinery, this new royal machinery of, of modernising the royal family. And, you know, I think there were great hopes for Harry, to be honest. It, it, and, you know, he was certainly probably the most popular member of the royal family at that particular time. Um, I suspect that when, when William married Kate, I mean, Harry adored Kate and Kate adored Harry, but I suspect that, as with every family, when one sibling marries, their focus turns slightly onto their, their new wife. And so everything looked good and, and remained so until, you know, his marriage and the, there was all that sort of... I, there was a lot of, I would say, controversy, but, you know, for the first time here you had a, a prince of the realm marrying a, an American divorcee of, 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 of mixed heritage. Um, but actually, I think the, the general feeling of that was very positive. I mean, I, remember, I was at Windsor commentating for a, 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 a US network about it. Personally, I, I thought it was a, an amazing step forward for the royal family. You know, 20, 30 years ago, this probably wouldn't have happened. Harry and Meghan's relationship doesn't seem well supported, especially by his older brother. William looked at Harry's relationship with Meghan that was going at a fearsome pace, moving at a fearsome pace, and uttered a word of warning. Um, said, look, you know, are, are you sure? Are you sure about this? You are going very, very, you know, you're, you're moving fast. Um, it, it was, I think, the most legitimate remark for, for William to make as his older brother. You know, their parents' marriage had disintegrated very largely because the two didn't know one another when they got married. They'd moved too quickly for altogether different reasons, but, but they had moved too quickly. So William was, was just adding a voice of caution. And Harry, I think, took it very badly. There were other friends of Harry's, old, old friends, who said much the same thing. Again, Harry took it very badly. But now that it is all official, Prince Harry, do you have that sense that the combination of the two of you, your different backgrounds, that you together represent something new for the royal family? Um, I don't know if it's something new. I think it's, um, you know, it's a, for me, it's a, an added member of the family. It's, a, it's, a, it's another, another team player as part of the, the bigger team. And, you know, for all of us, all we want to do is be able to carry out um, the right engagements, carry out our work and try and encourage others and the younger generation to be able to see the, the world in the, in the correct sense rather than um, perhaps being dis having a, a distorted view. So, you know, the fact that I, the fact that I fell in love with Megan so incredibly quickly was a, was a sort of confirmation to me that, that everything, everything, all the stars were aligned, everything was just perfect. It was this beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life. I <laughs> fell into her life. And the fact that she, I, I know the fact that she'll be really unbelievably good at the job part of it as well um, is obviously a huge, huge relief to me because she'll be able to deal with, with everything else that comes with it. But um, no, you know, we're, we're, we're a fantastic team. We know we are and, and we'll, we, we hope to, you know, over time, try and have as much impact for all the things that we care about as, as much as possible. I am very excited about that, yeah. I think then as time went by and Meghan moved into Kensington Palace and started, became a member of the, of the family, and there, were, there was unhappiness within the office. There were rumours um, that Meghan was bullying some of the staff. 
her method of working was not what they had been used to. Whether it was because she was American, whether it was because she was a, a movie star who treated people different in a different way, it was not what had happened in the past within that royal household. And I think William, when he heard that some members of staff were being reduced to tears or not enjoying their, their working life anymore, I think he got very angry. And, that, and he confronted Harry and told him what was going on, and Harry was protective of Meghan. So that is where I think the seeds of it all, a fracture in, in this bond that had been so close, came from. The announcement of Harry and Meghan's pregnancy shocked the world. Meghan and Harry welcomed the newest royal member a few weeks before their first anniversary. His name was announced two days later, Archie Harrison, Mountbatten, Windsor. Ex Marks of Sport. Um, uh, yes, um, I'm very excited to announce that uh, Megan and myself had a baby boy um, early this morning, a very healthy boy. Um, mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience I can ever um, possibly imagine. Um, how any woman does what they do is beyond comprehension, but we're both absolutely thrilled um, and so grateful to all the love and support for everybody out there, um, from everybody out there. It's been, um, it's been amazing, so we just wanted to share this with everybody. Doing things their way sounds like a destabilizing factor for the very traditional royal family, and behind this destabilization are unspoken conflicts, especially with his older brother, Prince William. Harry and Meghan left, as working members of the family, left the country, went to Canada first, then America. In September 2020, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex signed a multi-million dollar deal with Netflix. The concern that Harry and Meghan would expose the entirety of the royal family's life to the public arose. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have undertaken a public relations blitz, appearing in a buzzy primetime interview with Oprah Winfrey that drew millions of viewers. In the interview, the couple discussed mental health issues, and the Duchess said she had suicidal thoughts after marrying into the British royal family. It was a terrible interview which really did huge damage to the monarchy, to Britain as a whole, because Meghan talked about the country really being racist, and did huge, huge damage to his relationship with um, his father and with, with William. Harry also accused his father of cutting him off financially, which we now know actually wasn't true. We now know several things that were said in that interview were not true. Sir, have you broke? Have you spoken to your brother since the interview? <laughs> no, I haven't spoken to him yet, but I will do. And, and can you just let me know, is the, the royal family a racist family, sir? No, we're very much not a racist family. After the death of their grandfather, Prince Philip, William and Harry both attended the funeral on April 17th, 2021. This was the first time the brothers had been seen together since Harry left for America. I think certainly it was, it would have been a conscious decision of um, Prince William and Prince Harry to do that at the end of the service. Um, you know, the whole family, um, apart from the Queen, sort of walked back to the castle from the chapel. You know, the fact that Harry walked with William and Kate, I think, was perhaps a symbol that there is at least a willingness to um, to talk and perhaps to have some rapprochement between the two princes. I think as far as the Queen and, and the late Duke of Edinburgh are concerned, I think that they never really fell out with their grandson in the same way as, as perhaps he has done with his brother and, and to some extent his father. So I think that um, the Queen very much would would want there to be, you know, a, a sort of reuniting. There's still going to have to be 
um, discussions going forward. I mean, there's an inquiry, internal inquiry going on into some of the allegations that were made in that interview. And so I think there will be difficult conversations ahead. But I think that, yes, I think that from the Queen's point of view, she would want to smooth things over, really. In September 2021, the two brothers unveiled a statue of their mother, Diana, in the sunken garden of Kensington Palace. All smiles they would have known the world was watching, but this felt like a genuine reunion. Two sons who have had their troubles coming together with Princess Diana's brother and sisters to remember their mother. Sharing a joke and the duty of unveiling the statue, a lasting tribute to how Diana used her spotlight to shine a light on others. Paul, the, the princess, was a very public figure, and in many respects an icon, but she was somebody's mother. So that's, I paid the greatest heed to both princes and what they had to say. I think it'll take quite a lot of work for the, for the relationship to be restored to what it was. But I think that, you know, baby steps. And the fact that they were together, the fact that they were smiling together, um, laughing even at times, clearly talking is a real step forward. Yes, it is difficult to know if this was a show of unity just for one day, but it did feel like engagements from a couple of years ago when they were on much better terms, again, bouncing off each other today in a way that only brothers can. The two are very different characters, but they, they complement one another very well. And they've always had a great banter they tease each other mercilessly. They did rely on one another. Prince William, for all his understanding of the seriousness of his role in the future, you get the feeling that he makes it very clear that he needs his brother and he values that. On September the 8th, 2022, Queen Elizabeth II passed away at her home in Balmoral after a reign of 70 years. Her death left the royal family devastated. But the monarchy continued on in the face of grief after a period of mourning. On September 10th, 2022, the new Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, were joined by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at Windsor to view the tributes to the Queen and spent time talking to the crowds. There were mixed reactions from the people there. It was the first time since March 2020 that the two couples had been seen together. It appeared the brothers were trying to show the public that the tension had been squashed. The couple then attended the late Queen's funeral, with Harry marching behind the coffin with his family. In his first speech to the nation, King Charles confirmed that his son William would be taking on the title of Prince of Wales and succeeding to be the first in line for succession. As my heir, William now assumes the Scottish titles which have meant so much to me. Today, I am proud to create him Prince of Wales to Wusog Cymru, the country whose title I've been so greatly privileged to bear during so much of my life and duty. With Catherine beside him, our new Prince and Princess of Wales will, I know, continue to inspire and lead our national conversations, helping to bring the marginal to the center ground where vital help can be given. As Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine already hold strong connections to Wales, especially after William's work as an Air Force search and rescue pilot on the island of Anglesey. Prince William has made many official visits around the UK, meeting a broad range of people who make a difference in their community. With Kate at his side, 
he has also carried out overseas tours to the Commonwealth and beyond on behalf of the royal family. The couple's stability and dedication to service has caused them to be likened to Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Like his father, the King, Prince William has undertaken a very modern approach to his royal duties of representing the monarchy, including being a part of a few podcasts and celebrity interviews. On December 8, 2022, the All Access documentary series was released, titled Harry and Meghan. This was the couple's attempt to get across their side of the story, from their meeting and attempts to ingratiate into the royal family to their departure. If the trailers are anything to go by, the tone of it's going to be extremely uncomfortable for people on both sides of the Atlantic, and that's going to make family reconciliation even harder than it already is. You'll watch that series and think, the royal family need looking after, they've come out of it better, or you'll be on the side of Harry and Meghan and think, wow, they had to put up with a loss and I'm on their side. She's becoming. The series is unlike anything seen before, only close in comparison to the Panorama interview with Princess Diana in 1995. Years of stories half told and whispered through the media were expanded and clarified. The couple's first introduction was via an Instagram post Harry revealed. Meghan spoke about the whirlwind of the pressure of meeting Prince William and Princess Kate for the first time. The Sussex brand, both in the UK and America, uh, is being helped in one way uh, by this Netflix documentary series by bringing uh, the Sussexes back onto our radar screens, if not our TV screens. So uh, there is perhaps a fear that out of sight means out of mind. Uh, and by uh, cooperating with Netflix on a documentary like this, it gets us all talking about them again uh, and it keeps them uh, in the limelight and it keeps their, their brand uh, of Harry and Meghan uh, alive. For some reason, they feel very wronged, which I'm looking forward to finding out why. But they can't ask for privacy when they've made the Netflix series because everyone now is opening up a can of worms. There's no going back. There is no going back. I think if he wants to get some across, I think we, you know, that's one thing that we always do. We always hide things, and that's why you end up with, sadly, so much mental health. And so I think it's important that you, that that they can. Royals should be able to express themselves to everyone else. But I think the problem is it's the way it's been done. You know, doing it on Netflix, obviously for money. I think if he'd done it differently in other ways. For example, there was money, but it was donated to charities and that kind of thing. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to, it's, it's a difficult one. It's a really difficult one, but I think if it had been done differently, maybe people would have seen it differently. And I keep saying, I wonder what the end game is. And what I mean by that is, what, what, I wonder what he wants to achieve from it. Because, you know, if we're going to be realistic, uh, over the centuries, monarchies have never always been perfect. And there's been, there's been issues. and things have gone wrong or they've done things wrong or whatever, and, and sometimes you get people who try to fight against them, including family, and it never ends well. You know, the, the, because monarchy's not just about, a, this is where people get confused, not, it's not a king and queen, it's not a prince and princess, it's, it's, it's more, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, when he used the word institution or a firm, that is, or a company, that, that's it, and, and that will do everything to protect itself. I think if that's what he's trying to fight against, I. I just don't know how that's going to pan out. I don't know how it's going to work, and that's what I don't get, is what they, what he wants to, what will be the achievement at the end of it, other than causing so much upset to him and his family and his father, his brother. That's the bit I'm confused at. I just, I would love it if they could all sort it out somehow. Mm -hmm.